Welcome to the San Jose Hockey Now podcast. This is Shang Peng, Editor-in-Chief of San Jose Hockey Now. You can also find my work at MEC Sharks and on Twitter at Shang underscore Peng. And I'm Keeg McNally. You can find me on Twitter at Halfwall underscore Hockey at my website, half-wallhockey.com or at San Jose Hockey Now. We're back with our post-trade deadline show, Shang. Yes, and it's been a long, long day. I'm still at Shark Ice, as you can tell at the background. I'm never going home. I have a supply, endless supply of Coke Zeros here, and nothing mm-hmm. else to sustain me for the next week or so, and I will rely on that. Anyway, though, um, yeah, it's been a, a crazy day. Uh, when I, I first saw news of the hurdle trade, I double-checked my phone to make sure that Pierre Lebrun's name wasn't spelled L E. Yep. B U R N. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, and, and it's it's still a, a stunning trade. And anyway, uh, before we get to that, though, I guess I just wanted to talk through sort of the. I, I know that a lot of Sharks fans are upset, and I understand it. Uh, this might be the worst day in Sharks history. If you want to add on top of besides trading a franchise icon like Thomas Hurdle to your most bitter rivals too, the Golden Knights. Logan Couture also announced that his season is over and there's really no sense uh, when he's going to come back. And so really, uh, possibly the the worst day in franchise history. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. and it, this is my my honest uh, honest thought. I'm not, I'm not saying these things because uh, I'm just trying to say uh, nice things. I actually really like this move for the Sharks and we'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, this uh, this hurdle trade, and also I wanted to to remind you guys. I know I've been quoting uh, movies recently, but it's always uh, it's always darkest before the dawn, right? Um, and I, I that's that's that is genuinely what I see here. That it's gonna be it's tough right now. Obviously, you just traded fun must be always to the friggin' Vegas Golden Knights. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, you might see. Uh, uh, brace yourself for this. You might see Thomas Schurdle raising a Stanley Cup in a different team's jersey. But on the other hand, though, this was a move that needed to, to be made. should have been done two years ago. And the rebuild needed to start then. It didn't. And that, that and that's a mistake that uh, that uh, I think Mike Rear to a large part has, has rectified. And so anyway, I just wanted to remind everybody of that. So as tough as today is with the hurdle news, with the Katora news, that I do believe that brighter days are ahead, or at least they can be. The Sharks obviously had to execute on their draft picks, but the idea, the plan, I think, uh, is in place. Very well said. I I have many, many thoughts. Let's before we do the, the hurdle thing, let's talk yeah. about Couture a, a little okay. bit because I think that's kind of been lost in this news. And I have a whole segment about Couture that I or, or about hurdle that I want to talk about. But I think let's talk about Couture. So, oh, so before we do that, though, uh, mm-hmm. I don't want to interrupt, but we are going to talk about every uh, trade deadline trade uh, by the Sharks. Of course, we're going to start with the big one, Tom yep. Hurdle. But then we're going to go to Duclair, Kakinen, Shimmick, Ahotiuk, and the acquisition of Devin Cooley. Love it. So there is some uh, some other stuff that you can get to towards the towards the end of the episode. But we, we are going to get the big. If you're really out. hard, if you get to the Devin Cooley bit, then you're a real Sharks fan. If you can make it through my my emotional diatribe about Hurdle, then you can you can get anywhere. Um, <laughs> but let's talk about Couture because this one is snuck out of the radar. And it, it honestly, was something that maybe I thought might be happening this year and and uh, before he came back that I was kind of worried about was that his health might not permit him to play this year. And he even spoke about it a couple months ago that he, he didn't know if he would play Mm -hmm. came back and then played six games. Um, and then just didn't feel right. And then sat himself out kind of thing. Um, and now after this emotional day kind of just poured it all out and said, said, basically he's not going to play again this season. Is that right? Yep. Yep. And I just wanted to give you guys sort of the course of my day, just so you guys can kind of see what what it was like. So I got here at 9 a.m. because I wanted to be I didn't want to be driving while trades happened. So Mm -hmm. uh, I got I got here. I live in San Francisco, so it was a little, you know, it's an hour drive down. So I got here at 9 a.m. on my phone, try to try to ferret out a 
Alexander Barabanov trade, uh, Mikhail Granlin trade, a Meryl Farrell trade. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying. It's that 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 didn't happen, um, and I thought that those could be the biggest deals of of the day, uh, Ferraro or Sturm. Uh, for a hot second there, I thought that a Ferraro deal could happen. I've been kind of thinking that the last couple of days, but it didn't materialize, and so I didn't really report it. And so because I wasn't sure, sure. Mm. But anyway, though, um, I I was I was uh, tracking hard on that one, and so anyway, I. I'm working and I get to the, the Sharks Media Room, like I said, around uh, 12 p.m. And then I look at my phone and I start looking at <laughs> all these, uh, uh, the, these obviously fake Twitter accounts trying to try to trick us into, into thinking that the Sharks had traded their, uh, their franchise player to their most hated rivals. And the Sharks were supposed to skate at 12.30 today. It was an optional practice, but usually optional, an optional practice, you're still going to see 10 or so players, mostly the young ones, right? You'll see a William Eklund. You'll see a, a Thomas Bordalo out there, right? A, a Hotiuk before he's traded, right? Guys like that you'll see usually for sure. A couple of veterans sprinkled in there, right, for an optional practice. So it was really noteworthy that as the trade was announced, details were trickling out that no one came out. 12.30, 12.45, uh, 1 o'clock. One person came out, Justin Bailey, but he wasn't in uniform or anything. He came out literally in a T-shirt and shorts and in shoes and just came out on the ice and looked like he just wanted to kind of fill the stick a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so that's He did that for like five minutes and and and, and he left. Uh, about 1.30, we talked with, with Mike Greer. And David Quinn. And I'm going to really release that soon. The Sharks may have released a video for that already. I'm not quite sure uh, about that. Um, I've been working on some other stuff. Uh, just so you guys know, if you guys listen to this immediately, I have a trade grades coming out on NBC Sharks soon. And uh, also, too, I've been on a couple of radio shows. And also, I have to work uh, Twitter spaces with my buddy Sinbin, Ken, uh, from Vegas. And then also, I had to write that Couture season over story. Anyway, so... We talk with with Greer and Quinn, and we finish that. And you think, oh, now it's time to work. Uh, you know, Quinn uh, did do uh, uh, a justice and sort of setting out the scene for what happened, just how hard it was for everybody, how emotional it was. Thomas Shirtle was in the building today, saying goodbyes to people. Uh, Quinn shared this really uh, um, kind of a gut wrench, wrench, wrenching anecdote uh, as for a, for a Sharks fan at least that optional skate. He asked who any if anybody wanted to skate today, and no one raised their hand. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, that kind of day uh, for uh, for the Sharks organization, and like I said, only only Bailey came out uh, just for a little bit in uh, in t shirt and shorts, and so really just uh, uh, again a, a stunning, a heartbreaking day uh, for for Sharks fans, and so. We they asked us, uh, well, who do you want to talk to tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow at the Ottawa game is an early game. Usually an early game, we don't have a morning skate for a 4 p.m. game. Uh, we'll just get coaches and players about two and a half hours before the game tomorrow. And so we thought, okay, uh, this is uh, when I say we, I mean uh, Curtis from Mercury News and Max from the Hockey News. Uh, we're usually the ones. If if you don't like the choices for post game interviews, it's usually it's because of us. We, we choose the players, and if you like them, if you think we pick the right guys, also because of us because we pick them. So anyway, um, we thought of course that the the two guys we should talk to, you know, Mark Edward Vlasic played with Harold's entire career, sent out that crying uh, tweet right after the trade was announced. Obviously, Logan Couture, one of Hurdle's best friends on the team, also has played with Hurdle his entire career. Those would be the guys to talk to, right? And we asked for them tomorrow. However, uh, both guys prefer to talk today. And mm. <laughs> that makes sense, especially for Vlasic, because Vlasic will probably play tomorrow. And so talking about something like emotional, like Thomas Hurdle, two hours before the game isn't really ideal. Couture, I don't know. I'm not sure if, if he's going to be at the arena tomorrow or not. But anyway, um, so they said, hey, uh, both uh, both, uh, both uh, Logan and both Cooch and Eddie <laughs> – uh, their nicknames. Uh, Bo Kuch and Eddie are going to be ready to talk today. And so about three o'clock, we jump on uh, Zoom uh, with, uh, with the both of them. And so anyway, that's where that kind of uh, stream yeah. of uh, stories, you know, Couture knew about, Hurdle had talked to him quietly about the trade days and days ago. So 
Couture kind of knew what was happening. Uh, Vlasic shared this terrific anecdote uh, when he found out about the trade today uh, and Hurdle was in the building that he went up to Hurdle and showed Hurdle that uh, 2019 playoff clip, the double over overtime score goal that uh, Hurdle scored against yep. the Vegas Golden Knights in game six off of a Vlasic pass. And then Vlasic, you just hear in his voice, he said, well, now you're playing for them. <laughs> <laughs> like, like not, yeah. not, not, not angry, but just like, just couldn't believe it. You know, considering all the bad blood between the, 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 the two teams. But of course he wishes her to wall and hopes that her to win the Stanley cup with the Vegas golden Knights. Yeah. But anyway, so just, uh, just a, a tough, tough day. It's so anyway, around four o'clock, I'm able to start writing some stories and, and whatnot, but, and now I'm still here. It's about 8 PM. Um, and still have stories to write, you know, still haven't talked about sort of the emotional uh, a part of the day for Couture and Hurdle. Couture on the call with us, um, you could hear him. He was breaking down. He was he was crying, uh, thinking about uh, Thomas Hurdle and, and losing losing his friend. And so anyway, uh, it, it, it's it, it's been um, some kind of day uh, at, at Shark's Ice. And who would have thought when we started the day that the Sharks and, of course, the Golden Knights, too, would be the – well, everyone always knows about the Golden Knights, that they're going to be uh, the, the kings of the trade deadline, the epicenter of the trade deadline. But who knew that the Sharks would be the epicenter of the trade deadline, too? Yeah, that's – there's it's honestly – it was about, like, 2.50, and this is Eastern time. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sure, and, yeah. And – I'm sitting there like, wow, the Sharks have done nothing. Like they they've traded the player, <laughs> yeah. they've done yeah. so little. Jimmick and Costin was only deal had yeah. come through. I think at that at that point, I'm. And I was I like, all right, Greer. Came through. Yeah. Greer is punting this year. I was like, yeah, he's you know he's he hasn't done much this year. He, well, deals not... still come like an hour after exactly. I, I, I thought knew, maybe. I, knew he wasn't done, so. I thought maybe he'd get something, but I was like, okay, he didn't do much this year, and and that's what I was thinking at, at two fifty five or whatever. Mm -hmm um and it it just honestly is it felt like a tweet a fake twitter account like you mentioned like it was coming out of sources that were not real and then it kept getting confirmed over and over again and then i'm listening to uh nhl network and it's kevin weeks being like there's something big happening and it just kind of builds and builds and and then he's like oh it's two first round picks but the, the sharks are doing heavy retention and that's what kevin weeks had said on on the air Fucking, and... <laughs> fucking Bob McKenzie. Uh, yeah. guy, it's semi-retirement. He comes out with the biggest scoop of the trade deadline. And that scooped, I mean, everybody. <laughs> Every uh, single Elliot person. Freeman had no idea. Oh, none of the insiders that that the, our, our insiders today uh, uh, had had any idea, it seemed like. It's just Bobby and McKenzie. Fucking yeah. Bob McKenzie. In the words, and to, to paraphrase, to paraphrase the, the, the Catalina wine mixer. Fucking Catalina wine mixer. <laughs> it's fucking, fucking Bob McKenzie. Fucking Bab Bob McKenzie. <laughs> and um, I was in Canada recently, and I, I did not try a Bobby Margarita, but now I really... Now you need to. <laughs> I have to. And, I, you know, one day... Of I will try a Bob Margarita. Um, today, I have poured out many beers, including this beer, uh, for 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 Tomas Hurdle, which I'm going to drink throughout the episode. Well, I wish I had a beer here. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I think it's actually kind of a I have Coke Zero, but <laughs> that the the Shark Size doesn't have more beers because this is delicious. They have bars but... here, but I got to walk over. I'm recording this, so yeah. You I'm know, not sure if the Sharks will take kindly to me drinking a beer in their media room too. They I guess might. It's, kind of, it's after it's probably hours. it's after probably hours. worth it today. Anyway, the point is. I had a lot of thoughts. In the beginning, I was really, really just sad. I had no thoughts other than that sadness. Like, I I didn't analyze this as, like, a, a person who analyzes trades or sure. prospects or the draft, anything. I was just sad. I, I honestly, I remember Hurdle getting drafted. I remember what Hurdle meant to this team at the time. And it, it to me, Hurdle emphasizes, and I wrote a, I wrote an article on my, on my blog at um half dash uh, about Tomas Hurdle after this trade. Hurdle emphasizes uh an NHL management group operating at 100 percent efficiency. Mm -hmm. In 2012, the Sharks were 100 percent efficient on the ice, in the draft, in trades, and not a perfect team. Obviously, they didn't win the Stanley Cup, so they're not perfect, but they're efficient, right? Sure. The only center from the 2012 NHL entry draft, the only center to be a top six center throughout his career and top line, arguably the only one is Tomas Hurdle. And he was drafted 17th overall. That's 
unheard of in the NHL entry draft. That's like really, really insane because almost every good center is drafted top 10. If you're projected to be a top six center, you're drafted top set, top 10. Is it? Actually, I didn't, didn't, didn't really think about that. If you look through it, the, the second best is Chandler Stevenson, who was a fourth I line forward. I think specifically that year or center. drafts in general. Okay. For that year and for centers, okay. 2012, Tomas Hurdle is the best center. There's Philip Forsberg, who's a very good forward, but he's a winger. Bunch of defensemen. The only center is Tomas Hurdle. Who was the top center drafted in that draft? Tomas Hurdle. Oh, oh, you mean <laughs> you no, mean like in, no, in, in general? In the, yeah, the the I mean in, in the pick, who's the highest? Sure. Um, I believe. Uh, let me get the the actual name. Um, because so he was 17th. First was Neil Yakupov, Ryan Murray, winger, Alex Galchenyuk was was third. And was you could he argue a or winger though. He was drafted as a center. Okay. And he did play center for many years, but obviously mm -hmm. he's out of the league and there's many problems. Mm -hmm. Then they drafted like seven D's in a row. Mm -hmm. The next center was Mikhail Gregorenko, never got more okay. than a bottom six. Radic Fasca never got more than a bottom six. And then Tomas Hurdle was 17th. Oh, so, and this uh let me let me plug my uh, my story too, and it might make you guys cry more, but uh now than uh but uh, be, uh, before the Sharks made it to mm -hmm. Prague, I wrote a story about Tom Ushurdo and the Sharks' uh, path for drafting him. And I talked mm -hmm. with I Tim Burke. I talked with, um, yeah, I talked with a, a lot of people uh, about it. And I remember what Burke said. Burke said that uh, their, their second choice for that spot was Toivo Teravina, who I believe yep. went next. But uh, Hurdle was the guy that they wanted. They thought that Dallas, I think, was 13, was going to get Hurdle, but they went mm -hmm. with Hoxa instead. And anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a great story if, uh, if you want to, I guess, uh, relive some if, if you're if you're if you're drowning your misery in in some beer now i guess i guess yep. that's a good one so as i am but the point is is that if you're looking for a center is one of the most important positions in an angel team especially sure. in the draft it's it's then it's them and like your 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 top uh defender mm -hmm. um tomas hurdle is is almost entirely that draft like in terms of a center and to get him at 17 is just the Sharks got extremely lucky and they they drafted extremely well in that mm -hmm. draft. And what he did was he took a Sharks team that was, you know, very, very good. They had made the 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 playoffs eight years in a row before drafting Tomas Hurdle, 12 of the last 13 before drafting Tomas Hurdle, and they extended their window for another six years. That's all they did by drafting Tomas Hurdle. And that's what the power of, of drafting well can do for you and mm -hmm. what Tomas Hurdle, a player like him, can do. Drafting and well late, too. Drafting well late and, and taking advantage of those later first round picks. So in some ways, it just it epitomizes like what the Sharks were and what they are now. That that whole regime is gone. All mm -hmm. of those players, all of those built up faith and hope are gone. Like there no there's nowhere to be found. Couture and Vlasic and LeBanc, I think, are the last uh players from the twenty nineteen playoff run, I think. Yeah, and uh, so, actually, what I always forget is uh, he wasn't part of the 2019 run, but uh, Shark from that era, uh, technically, Ryan Carpenter. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, he was around. <laughs> I always forget that. A couple of years before, but yeah. Yeah, so, and, and it just, it makes a lot of sense that the team that was efficient for 20 years trades hurdle to the most efficient NHL franchise right now, which is the Vegas Golden Knights. Like, the most efficient they use every bit of cap space every loophole every single draft pick to their expense at a 100 percent efficiency level and it makes sense like i don't know to me it made a lot of sense that hurdle went to their franchise and and they understand the opportunity there with hurdle and why they needed to acquire him at exactly the cap hit they did and for the price they did um all of that being said i'm very very sad that hurdle is tr is traded um but it made a lot of sense for the Vegas Golden Knights, why they got him. And then even more importantly, it made a ton of sense of why the Sharks did it. Mm -hmm. I think if the Sharks trade hurdle two years ago, they probably get a first and a prospect equivalent to Edstrom yeah. at the time. Um, but they didn't. <laughs> they made a mistake. They made an error in, in, in you know, this is not, this is my opinion, but in my opinion, they made an error. They yeah, well, didn't I share recognize, <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people do. They didn't recognize what they needed to do to move forward for the franchise two years ago. 
and now we're paying for it. And the, the price to pay for it is two more third round picks and 70% retention. So that's about it. Like, I, I don't see it any more than that. This two years ago, this is a first in Edstrom or an Edstrom equivalent. Now it's a first Edstrom and two third round picks and 70% retention. It yeah. sucks, but here we are. And the Sharks needed to rebuild and it, it hurts a lot, but it needed to be in two years ago. And, and Mike Greer is not afraid of it. Mike Greer doesn't have the emotional attachment that myself and a lot of fans have to the team, to the to the golden age Sharks that we love and we think hope will come back. He doesn't have that other than he played for the golden age Sharks at some point. Um, it, he doesn't have that. So we, we have to recognize that he's doing the job of an NHL GM and this is the value of Tomas Hurdle. That's, that's that. I I think uh, that that blew my mind. I I personally give Greer a ton of credit because he walked back um, sort of the the last, in my opinion, yeah, the last uh, 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 bad decision of of the Wilson era. It was Joel mm -hmm. that signed Hurdle, but once again, it was this was from the Wilson regime. They were always going to re-sign Hurdle, and I yep. think uh, Will was just working under that that. Uh, <clears throat> that that halo kind of and so anyway to to walk back that that move in this way and we talk about the you've mentioned the third round picks and the money retained which aren't great i i get that but first with the picks right and i've talked about this in a couple of places but the farther picks go out especially if they're non-premium picks they're not first round picks or not even a second round pick right that 2027 third round pick the sharks are going to get that back in no time you won't even know that that was missing. The 2025 one, okay, that one's uh, two years from now, so you might you, the Sharks may not be able to recoup that. I don't know, but the 2027 one so far out. The yeah. money, the money doesn't sound sound great. Six years of retention, but if you think about it though, with the rising cap, right, it's a lot of money cumulatively. But per season, it's 1.3 million about, right? And 1.3 million, uh, the veterans minimum right now is just a shade over $750,000, 762,500. And with the rising cap, that really per year isn't, isn't that bad either. Yeah. And so the cost of kind of walking back that mistake from 2022 wasn't that great. And I think that's what Mike and his staff basically saw that it took one hungry team um, look, I, I know that it's going to sound like like this is like a, a shark's planted information. I talked with the, with the scout, an NHL scout, not with the sharks, not with the Golden Knights, and he said he thought that the that this was a desperation move by Vegas, considering yep. Mark Stone's injury and, and, and that sort of thing, right? And considering Hurdle's age and the risk associated with Hurdle, right? And think about and again, Hurdle too, isn't a a Sorry to interrupt, but Hurdle isn't a, um, he's not a fast player. Hurdle's a, a sure. slow player by nature. He's a, he's a guy that like, if he loses a step, he could be literally unplayable at the NHL level. I mean, he may have already lost a little bit of it though. He has had a very good season this year. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that he's quite what he was in 2018, 19, but he is, uh, I think much better than he was last year. Um, yeah. uh, but Anyway, though, just just uh, think about, too, that, okay, think about Hurdle last year, right, and how unhappy the fan base was with him, right, and, and Jed, not everybody, but a lot of a lot of the fans, right? Think about that. You're, that I'm telling you that you can get two first-round picks for Tomas Hurdle. Mm -hmm. And this isn't one of those kind of bullshit, like, oh, it's a first-round pick, but it's from 2020 or 2019. It's a guy that's failed already, right, first-round sure. pick. This is uh, Edstrom, who was just picked, who in a redraft would still go in the first round, maybe higher because I think his stock has risen. Since Probably a couple draft. picks for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so this is a, still a, a, a guy who is a first round pick value. Mm -hmm. And obviously the 2025 first round pick too, that's uh, unprotected. And so if I told you last year you're getting two first rounders for Tomas Turtle, everyone would have would have been, oh, wow, really? Yeah. And of course you don't like the third round picks, but third round picks are, you can live with that cost. Right. And then the retention, that is a little bit, that's the thing that's very bold. I, I wouldn't have expected the Sharks to retain six years. Right. Yeah. But the AAV, the, the per year retention though, that that's not that much. I mean, it's not that, that far from what they're, what they For retain sure. with Carlson, right. But Carlson, I think was like 15% or something like that. Right. Yeah. And so it's not that, that far from that. And so, so I don't know. I don't think too much about that. I, I think about 
This is two premium assets. David Edstrom, from what I understand, people I've talked to, a high character middle six center. So basically, he's not just a middle six. He's not going to be just a points guy, empty calorie mm -hmm. points guy. He's going to be a guy that if he becomes who he should be, he's mm -hmm. going to be a winner. He's going to be a winning player. Now, he's not going to be Tom Turtle probably, but he's going to be a really good uh Second line center is his ceiling maybe, but maybe ends up as a really good third line center. So yeah. anyway, a strong middle six center that you can win with. And that's very, very valuable. And so, so excellent, excellent prospect right there. And so I think it reminds actually all this reminds you, you just need a one motivated team. It's just like the Eric Carlson uh, uh, trade yep. in some ways. I mean, Eric Carlson two years ago had the worst contract in the NHL. There was no way hire Harry. You're going to move the deal, even if you took on a bunch of money, right? You know, you weren't gonna, you weren't going, going, going to, going to get anything back, and not a first round pick of all things, right? But you needed a desperate GM, a desperate team in Pittsburgh trying to prop open their window as long as they could to get. Uh, get a Pittsburgh's first round pick, be it uh, this year or next year. And the same goes kind of here that uh, while you understand, of course, that the, why the Golden Knights did it, it's their window right now. Um, they, they, they want to prop that open as long as they can. They're the defending champs, of course. So they want to repeat all kinds of good reasons for them to do it right. Um, so I, I'm not saying that's a bad deal for them. And like I said, uh, like I said a lot, I think that Thomas Shirtle is pretty mm -hmm. close to back to, 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 to what he was a couple of years ago. So great player, outstanding player, even better off the ice. Um, so you, you, you love all that for them, but obviously for the sharks in their timeline, uh, Thomas Shirtle was wasting the, the, the last of the best years of his career here. There was just what was what was he going to do? He's not Connor McDavid. He's not going to carry them to a playoff spot uh, just just on his own. He's not that kind of player, right? Um, and so, it just was wasting his best years here. And so, anyway, also another part of the people also I think is kind of uh, under under said today is that Thomas Shirtle had a complete full no movement clause. Yeah. So it's not like Mike Rick could just offer him around the league and best offer gets him. Thomas Hurdle had to want to go to where he where he was going, and so the, uh, Hurdle wanted to wants to win. I know that that's a point of confusion that I think I've addressed on the podcast, but I want to say it again. If if you're a new listener or whatever, when Hurdle resigned in 2020, it was a hundred percent not for a rebuild. Remember that they were still in the Wilson regime, where the Wilson regime was all about reload, reload, reload. We can keep this window open with this team. So it's like they kept going with, uh, it's like the, I'm going to get very nerdy here, but it's like the DC Extended Universe movies. They kept coming out with bad movies uh, that bombed their box office. It's like, no, sure. no, no, we're going to get it right this time. No, 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 we're going to get it right this No, 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 we're going to get it right this time. Yeah. And eventually you just had to kind of uh, rip off the band-aid, cut the cord on, on, on all that. And so anyway, uh, when Hurdle resigned, I don't know, I still don't know specifically what was promised to him, but I know it wasn't a rebuild. Yeah. And I, I know that as a fact that it wasn't a rebuild. So a lot of people say, oh, Hurdle should have known. And from a distance, right, obviously, right? Like, yeah, it looked like either whatever the Sharks were going to try then to try to win with Hurdle and Carlson and Couture, that 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 was uh, uh, that wasn't going to work. Right. Like, like I could have told you that in 2022, but the Sharks didn't think so. Right. The Sharks thought that they could still somehow find a way to 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 win with yep. with 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 that core. And, and anyway, um, so Hurdle, I Hurdle didn't sign up for this. And so Hurdle, I, as I've, I think I have alluded to. Right. I think we talked about this in the mailbag. Right. That like it's been my belief and there's been subtle signs from Hurdle that this this losing is not something that 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 he wanted to be a part of that he signed up for um and so if the choice was there that he would i think that that he would want to move the thing that we talked about was whether or not that choice would be there of course because the sharks only had one retention yeah. spot and had no idea that the sharks would be willing to retain six years so i think that's the big thing there that that i didn't calculate that the sharks would be willing to do that i figured naturally that Kator would get the first crack at it when if and when he ever got healthy again right and then after after like 
you know, at the same time, the Burns and Carlson retentions would expire around that thereabouts that same time, right? And then it'll be Hurdle's turn to leave a couple of years from now. And that's what I sort of thought what might happen, but the Sharks were very aggressive. I think, the, like I said, Golden Knights were very aggressive too. They offered a package that's reminiscent of what Hurdle would have would have uh would have uh garnered in 2022 and the sharks jumped at it which is i think again very understandable with all this sort of um how do you say it uh uh extenuating uh, uh factors like i mentioned you know hurdle sure. with full control and, and all those sort of things you know hurdle wanted to go to a team that was going to win and if there's no team represents that more now than the golden knights yeah i um and I, I, I'm happy for Hurdle. I really am. I think that Hurdle, he deserves it. He's, ever since he came into the NHL, he's been a bright spot for the Sharks, and he's been a, a professional, and he's conducted himself in a way that I think he deserves this chance to be sure. on a team that's going to win. And he sure. had that for many years with the Sharks, and it didn't work out. And and I think you're right. I think he he thought maybe the Sharks could turn this around faster than they could, and then Greer. I, that's I think that's what him. they told them. Yeah, that's what yeah. they told him when Joe will resign him. I think that's what they told them that they. And that's I think what Greer they were kind of told him at some point over the last <laughs> year and a half, like this isn't going to happen. Uh, like maybe that. not. You know, we'll roll so, the dice with you guys with Eric Carlson and Timo uh, last year and see what happens. And they 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 lose their first five games. It goes zero five and zero, and then uh, yeah. literally a month into Greer's regime, right. Uh, Mike Rur, I think it was at the Hall of Fame, Hockey Hall of Fame. Yeah, he was attending and he told a reporter, Yeah, everybody is available except for Hurdle. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if you guys remember that, but I was like, Whoa, <laughs> yeah, he's like this same so, as so much bad. for, yeah, yeah. And uh, honestly, it, I, I don't know, at some point two, three years ago, the Sharks had like so many contracts where it was underperforming, right? Like mm -hmm. you had everybody on underperforming you had martin jones eric carlson you know even brett burns at some point people were like hey, is he worth yeah, a million he just, dollars he's just a good year? defenseman now yeah, uh, yeah evander Kutcher, kane evander, evander kane, kane. Under, underperforming in the locker room performing well on the ice but underperforming in the locker room <laughs> and you had all of these contracts and people were like how the hell are the sharks gonna get out of this and i think um i don't know i people wanted them to get out of it at the time. And I think they yeah. just waited a couple more years and, and now they are. And this is a rebuild are, are upset that they're rebuilding. But to be honest, this is it. Like Vlasic's on the end of his contract. Couture is, is injured and who knows about his playing status in the future. Those are the last two contracts that the Sharks have. Like that's it um, that are big and Couture hurdles now gone and, Yes, we have to eat some retention slots for, for next year. We have Burns that expires at the end of next year, and then uh, Carlson and, and Hurdle for a while. But I don't know. And even Greer said it in his press conference that, like, the one, like, losing the retention spot, yeah, it sucks, but you might lose out on, like, a fourth or fifth round pick right. next year. But who cares? I, I think, think the <laughs> one deal that might might have been uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, screwed up by by the hurdle taking up the retention spot was Barrett Bon off uh, leaving sure. town. And uh, Greer said that there was a deal that was close. I got to check up if that was indeed a Barrett Bon off deal. I think, I think it was probably, but yeah. it, it could have been somebody else could have been like a Cunning or somebody else too, but okay. So you retain half on a Barrett Bon off or the rest of, or whatever. Yeah. You're you retain half fifth. on it. You or get a, a fifth, you get a fourth, you know, you get maybe a third, but probably not even right. A fourth or a fifth, right? Instead you retain on hurdle. And of course, yeah, it's a number of years, right? But Hey, it's Hassel's money. Uh, the cap is going up, so it won't be that much of the cap. And yep. you have two first round picks to show for it. And I more, mean, more importantly to me, like, and again, I'm not an NHL scout, but I've watched David Edstrom many times. I like David Edstrom. Like he's a very good prospect. This is a very good prospect. Yeah. He's again, I know, <laughs> I know it's not the most exciting of prospects in terms of, Hey, you didn't get the, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you didn't get logan cooley or something like that right you sure. didn't get a, a blue chip guy but you're not going to get those right in deals like this we saw this with timo meyer last year right like you're not yeah. going to get dawson mercer you're not going to get luke hughes the teams know who they've got right uh, they're not going to give them up right for a guy that is about to be rfa it's gonna be very expensive in timo right but still you yeah. pick the right guy like a mukum abdulin right you see that's a really really good player he may not be he may not have been the best prospect in the devil system but very very good player edstrom um Probably is the best prospect he in the Vegas system, right? Yeah, but sure. uh, um, he necessar isn't necessarily going to be a superstar, right? But he should be a very, very good winning player.
Yep. And so I, I think again that um, I, you know, I, I you know, want to I guess talk about the uh, the motion of it, and I don't have the motion of it obviously because, as you guys all know, I didn't grow up a Sharks fan. So, but I mm -hmm. I've been through similar things when I was a fan as a Kings fan, right? So I I'm not the emotion isn't lost on me. So I get it. Um, I get not only losing a, a guy like Hurdle, but trading him to your to your rival. It sucks. Um, and like I said, you really brace yourself. There's a fair chance you will see Thomas Riddle raise it. I'm going to say it again, not not because I want to sting your ears, because, uh, but because I want to bring that reality to you that there's a good chance that you're going to see Thomas Riddle uh, wearing Golden Knights jersey, raising a Stanley Cup. There's a decent chance of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the the value that they got as as a hockey move, this is this was a good hockey move. Um, and again, the retention, I just, we talked a lot about mm -hmm. is not that bad, really. Right. If you look at it on a per year basis, uh, the third round picks, like I mentioned, uh, not, not that big a deal. Yeah. And especially the 2027 one. Right. And look, so this is one of those things where like, and, uh, an unprotected first. Right. right. And you never know. Right. And so you I brought know. this up a lot because Peng penguins are way worse than people thought they were going to be this let's, year let's even sharks go back. are going to be way uh, sorry yeah. sorry sorry eric carlson for 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 throwing you under the bus yeah. continually but 2018 when the sharks trade for eric carlson right nobody thought no one that. thought that 2020 first round pick everyone was like oh it's fine no problem like at, at worst it's going to be like a low 20s you know 25 30 right no problem we just got the best defenseman in the world no no problem right yep and of course, look what happened, right? And that pick ends up unprotected. Especially for a trapped team with a bunch of veterans like the, the Golden Knights are. You, yeah, you really don't don't know what will happen mm -hmm. with teams, right? Obviously, you mentioned Pittsburgh, right? And I think everybody had them in the playoffs at least, right? No one, no yep. one predicted what the the state that they're they're in now. And so you just never know with veteran teams. Even the again the Sharks, Sharks 2019-20. Yeah, they lost Joe Pavelski. Hey, we still have Eric Carlson. Uh, Joe Thurston's still pretty good. He still was a good player the year before. Well, you know, so players get old, all kinds of stuff happen, right? Players come off injury like Carlson did back back then, right? And yep. so you really just never know. And so it is a value that uh, that Mike Greer got that 2025 pick unprotected. Um, yes, likely it's going to be a late pick, but you really never know. I mean, you never know. That's why Kyle Dubas, as desperate as he was, made sure that the 2024 pick he gave to the Sharks was at least top 10 protected, right? Because you, you never know, right? And I think maybe that Wilson trade, I don't know if that, I'm sorry, the Carlson trade 2018 made by Doug Wilson, maybe that was a little bit of a lesson, right, to the other uh, other organizations in the league that uh, you better <laughs> better at least protect that just because you, you never know. And yeah. Anyway, um, so I'm not done with this. I've been really uh, busy today, so I haven't kind of pulled the coat of, 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 of every source possible to ask, right? But I asked, uh, I would say, uh, a half dozen of the sources that some of my closer sources, right? Um, one source that famously last year was a source that said of the Timo Meyer trade, and I, I, I know some of you guys remember this, said that that the Sharks got nobody back who's going to score 10 goals in a season. <laughs> and then Sutherland has Sutherland, more goals. Sutherland, yeah, than... <laughs> right. Yeah. So so, so this this person is not predisposed to to liking sure. what the Sharks did, right? Uh, or what the Sharks do. And while he also didn't love the retention and the third-round picks, no one does, right? Uh, the foundation of the deal, though, Edstrom, 20-25 20, 20, pick, He's like, yeah, that's that's a good foundation, and that's in his estimate estimation would have been a foundation of a 2022 deal for Hurdle too, yeah. and so these so so I went with with sort of the people a lot of the people that I trust the most, and five people all said it was it was it was good. <laughs> they did well to trade trade Hurdle while the going was good. Now some people may have thought it was a great deal. Some people was like, oh, it's good. You know, they don't like some of the the side things like I like like we talked about right the. The, the picks and the retention, but they all thought they everyone sees Edstrom and a first round pick, unprotected first round pick, and so everyone's like, "Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good deal. It's good for Hurdle. It's good for the Sharks." Uh, you know, one source thought that maybe the Sharks could do better for a player of Hurdle's caliber, but I personally have a lot of doubts about that. But considering, and we didn't get into it because, uh, well, I think we all know, right, that Hurdle's deal, uh, uh, Hurdle himself has so much risk. 
And I guess we alluded to his knee injuries, right? But just you just don't know. And and um, yeah, yeah, and so the Sharks headed off that risk uh, with with this deal too, which I think yep. is just uh, I. I don't. I. I. I think. I. I think. I think that they did a really good job uh, with this trade. I mean, I thought it was an amazing trade at first when I when you know Darren Drager reported initially that Sharks had got the third round picks, but I think it's still a very good trade though. And it's again, it's it's um, yeah. Necessary. Basically, basically, my career restarted the rebuild uh, trade deadline twenty twenty two, which is what the organization should have done. And. Yeah, and so you know he basically went back in time and took over as GM into 2022 and said, "Oh nope, <laughs> we're not we're not resigning this guy." And yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I told you guys all along, right? That I I don't believe that Greer would have resigned uh, a hurdle if he was in the seat then. And I don't think so. I think this basically proves it. So. Yeah, he would have he would have basically made this trade, but gotten a little bit better. Return. Yeah, a little better. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe maybe. Uh, uh, a mm-hmm. decent, you know, maybe uh, maybe he, he would have got the third round picks in return or another like kind of like C level prospect, right? Like a we'll talk about him soon, like a Jack Thompson in addition True. to the deal or something, something good, right? But again, the core of it uh, and all of it depends on execution. And the sharks are yeah. this is my biggest part is the sharks are free, like they're they're it, they're, like yeah. We worried so long about what what are the sharks going to do to get out of all of these contracts. And about free. three million tied into Carlson and and uh, and Hurdle. I don't really count Burns because that one's going to go pretty soon. And yeah. I mean, even look at this, right? Let's look at this way Jones's too. Jones's like, buyout decreases next year too, right? so it's yeah. Burn the Burns deal. I can still defend it because Burns specifically wanted to go to Carolina, and it doesn't sound like uh, going sure. looking back then there just wasn't a lot of good offers out there, right? I have talked to people since then, though. One scout, a uh, guy that I trust, told me, "Yeah, I still think that they should have just held on to him in, in season for a little longer. It's just some Maybe. so desperation yeah. could could sink in, and, and so they can get a little more, even if you send them to the place that he wants to go to, right? So that being the case, right? And anyway, we can't agree that." Whatever Mike's intentions with the Burns trade, that the, the return was light. The return was light back then, and it looks even lighter now with uh, uh, with, uh, with with Eto Makaniemi and his situation, his injury situation, right? And it's third round pick and Stephen Lawrence. Well, I guess you can that turned into the Duclair trade, right? But still, that's a that's a light return for for Brent Burns. This is not a light return for Thomas Schurdle. You got two first round picks, no matter how you slice it. You got two first round picks, um, and like I said, yeah, like unlike the Carlson deal, which I questioned because I wondered about the the retention there, right? For four more years, right? I, I do understand you don't want to retain two, but you don't want to retain 50% on six more years. You know, at of some course, point you yeah. want to start winning games, right? And so low retention amount, gave up some some decent picks in third rounders, but not premium picks, right? I mean, Luke Cunning won for a third round pick. So like that's uh, yeah. you know what they thought Luke Cunningham, a good Luke Cunningham went for the ground pick, right? Yeah. And so it's this, this I, again, you, you look at the core of this deal, and you don't like some of the side stuff, but the core of this deal, I, I it's, I think it's, it's, it's outstanding. I, I don't, I don't think the Sharks could have had a better if, if they played out the stream with Hurdle and just kind of waited, uh, maybe to tell this off season. I don't know if there's a better deal out there because again, it takes just like with Carlson, right? It took a very motivated team to pony up uh, a premium asset for a great player, but on an awful contract, right? And Hurdle's contract, not as awful as Carlson's, but still not a good contract considering age and all that risk associated, right? So here we are. And I, yeah, I emotionally, I hate it. Logically, it makes a lot of sense. It's a good and hockey trade, I think. It's a good... I mean, considering the cap... The, yeah, and all that the, stuff. The yeah. uh, the Golden Knights made it hurt a little bit. That's all I would say is that they made it hurt a little bit to make it not perfect for the Sharks. But eh, I think they got the best, the most they could at this point for Tomo Shortle. Oh, yeah. And absolutely. it also, it absolutely. also, yeah. it just triggers again that this is it. Like we are going to be the worst team in the NHL for this year and next year. All right, Macklin still is. Uh, yeah, and Hagen's up the middle. And Hagen's, it's it's it's, it's, it's <laughs> Bellbrini Higgins is the center, right? Actually, yeah, I yeah. I, I, I don't look too far ahead on drafts because yep, I we're gonna be the worst the team. Ice in front of me, so yeah, the worst team in the NHL for the next two years. And or that's, tomorrow, <laughs> and that's something, I guess. Um, and it needed to happen two years ago. It needed to happen, though, yeah. So I don't know. To everybody, all the Sharks fans, 
yes, there are aspects of this deal that are not perfect. But if you if you wait along for the perfect deal for Tomas Hurdle, Eric Carlson, Brett Burns, and, and Team Wire, it's good. They're going to pass you by, and you'll end up with Alexander Barabanov, who, who who doesn't get a deal done. Like yeah, you have to do the deal. You have to strike when the iron's hot. You have to do the deal when it's there, and the deal was there, and it's worth it. I and, and I yeah, I had to go are. back a little bit on um you know what I said about the Timo Meyer trade, right? Because I thought that maybe the Sharks should hold and maybe get a desperate team. But in the end of the day, they're they made pretty well in that trade. Yeah, it looks like they did they did pretty well in that trade, right? And so yeah. you know, my only bone of contention was Carlson was I do still think they should have retained more and gotten more uh mm-hmm. from the Penguins, but uh that's that's Hassel's money. That's not my money. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at, um, again, the Burns trade, not ideal because the return was, was light still is light, but just, you can't say that about, about this, even with Carlson, right. Which of course that the first round pick was really more for taking on the bad contracts. Right. But nonetheless, though, you got a first round pick though. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I, I, again, I, I, I think, uh, I don't want to, blow you know too much smoke up my career's ass you know uh, yeah it's all i don't want to be too much of a apology it's but. it's you know if they if they fail with their draft picks then my career is going to get canned in a couple in a few years but they've set themselves up with the sort of the appropriate amount of you know just the just the number of picks that you, that you need to start really seriously be in a rebuild right multiple first rounders all that kind of stuff right they're yeah. setting themselves up for that so if they hit on their picks um, then this team's going to be powerhouse. If they don't hit on their picks, then yeah, it could be the, I heard the phrase, the Affinity build, right? Which was, I think, the, the Edmonton Oilers uh, before they mm-hmm. got Connor McDavid when they kept yeah. getting number one picks, but, you know, drafting guys like uh, Nugent Hopkins and Hall and uh, Yakupov and Everly anyway. and all that stuff. Yeah, was Everly. Everly first? yeah. No, I don't think he was the first, but he was, um, I think he was the top five. Um, so anyway, mm-hmm. so yeah, so the Affinity build. So, and actually, the, the Oilers did actually draft pretty well, actually, in a lot of ways. But anyway, though, the the the, the point is that it's it does come down to execution. So the job yep. is like half done at bet, right? Half the job is getting the getting the picks for your scouting staff, and the other half is uh, is the Making scouting and the development too. And so, and so I, we'll see. In but. some ways, in some ways, I think the the 2023 draft which is really like micers like first total draft there's been so many successes i mean it, it, these are not it's still early players. though it's still no, early I, though. I don't i don't want to be it's like as of this time the 20 okay. la, uh, last year this time we were raving about philip uh, beastead and how the sharks fleeced uh you know they went back they got beastead they went back of in course. the draft training the 11th pick and they got beastead and lun and havlet beastead all we have to do regress, so but yeah i know uh, okay well, I'm going to finish my sentence. So, okay. so all we have to do is is judge on the the play that's been done, and the okay. play that's been Fair. done has Quint Musty leading the OHL in points per game, sure. and Will Smith leading the NCAA in, sure. in points. So that's all we have to go on, and it's a success. Whether or not that translates, who knows? But yeah. the point is, is you you if if it, you know Will Smith was putting up 0.5 points per game, and Quint Musty was 0.75 points per game in the OHL. We'd be like, the fuck is Guru doing? <laughs> why are we why are we paying attention to this guy who has no idea what he's doing? But yeah. And he, he picks up Luca Cagnoni in the fourth round. Like there's some method to this that I think we have to kind of trust. And sure. we uh, in some ways trusted a little too much, I think, with with Doug Wilson Jr.'s drafting. Well, and Doug too, because they had so much and success Doug. for so long. You just thought, well, yeah. You guys had, know what they're doing. They've shown they you know. Got a, they know what yeah, they got a hurdle in Couture, and yeah. they got like so many good dudes for so long, and Meyer and 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 LeBanc even yep. like so many good prospects, and, and you know even before that with Pavelski and Braun, and mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. they were a very good drafting team. That we just trusted them to lead this new age of the NHL and the Sharks, and it was a faulty. I'll say mm-hmm. that, and uh, we were wrong, and hopefully. Career understands what the the next age of the NHL and the Sharks are going to be, and, and I think we just have to give a little bit of faith for a little while. And Greer is still young at this, and I think a lot of ways pundits and media people are a little uh, unfair to Greer in terms of how long he's had to do this job in a very 
extremely difficult job. Sure. Um, like really, really friggin. I don't know how to describe how horrible it is to get out of these contracts, <laughs> but it's it's hard. It, it, I mean, I would think it's one of the it. hardest jobs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, GM jobs uh, for somebody to take over in recent league history. I would think with the amount for of sure. bad contracts, right? Not just a couple, but like a half dozen or so. Well, uh, you know that they started to 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 pull it away a couple of years uh, or a year or so before Greer with like Martin Jones and stuff. But okay. anyway, I just wanted to close too, uh, just with the the thought that uh, and we we you and I agree uh, uh, with this that. I think we see, I think there's, there's some like national question of, Oh, what is my career's plan? Et cetera, et cetera. I get that too, from my sources, sources I trust too, that they're, they're, they're not sure about this or that. Right. But, um, I think we've always maintained on a podcast that I th think we see the plan, uh, just a matter uh, of execution, but the plan mm -hmm. is good. And this is part of the plan. This sticks with the plan. Yeah. I mean, what are we going to do with a 33 year old Tomas hurdle? I don't know. Or like a 34-year-old Tomas Hurdle. Kiss <laughs> babies. <laughs> Kiss babies, I guess, and wave a lot. And same thing with Kachur and Vlasic. I, I love them. Great Sharks veterans for, for a very long time. They're not part of the future team that's going to win a Stanley Cup. And and Hurdle, if you love Hurdle, you want to see him win, win a Stanley Cup, good. If you think that this was a good trade for the Sharks because Hurdle's going to get worse, good. It does Either way, you win. So, be happy. He either wins the Stanley Cup with the Vegas Golden Knights being an awesome player, or he doesn't, and we traded him at the right time. So you win. That's all you should say is we win, we get a first and David Edstrom. So that's it. That's my uh that's that's my uh spiel. We've talked like 45 minutes about hurdle. Well, it's the the trade, the trade of the day, right? So it really is. <laughs> I guarantee that we won't talk 45 minutes about uh Devin Cooley. So <laughs> I might. <laughs> no i won't no he's um, not related to logan so yeah no we won't. <laughs> the duclair one or the duclair trade was the the trade that i thought was going to be the big trade of the day yeah. i was like all right this is it we get a third in jack thompson cool and i was kind of underwhelmed at, at the beginning not that i think it's actually to be honest a very I don't know, very good trade. Like it's I think just, it's a terrific it, trade. It's a terrific trade. <laughs> I think it's they, probably better than a hurdle trade in some ways. They targeted because, yeah, an area just the of value need. value you got back, yeah. Yeah, they targeted an area of need. They got the, the value that Duclair was worth. There was no retention. It was just like simple. We have a guy that's hot. Do you want him to try and help win? We want your one of your best prospects and a third round pick. And it was simple. I liked it. Um, yeah, I mean, I would an caution with uh, mm -hmm. the the prospect. Like, he's highly rated in the Tampa system, but the Tampa doesn't have a great system. It's so bad. <laughs> yeah. So uh, people I talk to, they they do think he is a good prospect, but he probably <laughs> ends up being more of a if if he pans out as a bottom pairing guy, but a very good bottom pairing guy. And so if he does, that's still a very useful player. And so yeah, so I yeah, that's that's a good trade for a guy like Duclair, who I know. Uh, Near the end, there was started start, start scoring a lot, but I've talked a lot about it. Uh, Duclair's game is a pretty uh, simple. He is fast. He can finish, uh, but then there's not much else there, right? And we talk about sort of the leadership aspect there, too, where he's good in the locker room. He's been sort of a mentor for the younger players, and that that is an important thing for sure. But like with Hurdle, Hurdle has been a leader, too, um, that – if you can get good value for these guys, though, who their ages don't fit your timeline, even if they are good leaders, you really have to think about it. You have to consider it, right? Whereas I think with guys like, and they still have good leaders in the room, good influences, right? Like Randlin, like Cunnin, like Sturm, like Ferraro, right? I don't think the deals were quality enough for, for Greer to be like, okay, I'm going to lose this yeah. bit of leadership uh, this year to to trade you uh, uh, Mikhail Granlin. Next year might be a different story. But um, anyway, um, so you lose that with a Duclair, you lose that in a hurdle, but it's sort of the trade off, right? To kind of move your franchise forward. You can't keep tw late twenties, early thirties, uh, players, uh, um, uh, when you can get good stuff back just because they're good in a room too. I know it's a balance. Yeah. I, I talk about, you can't, uh, I, I talk a lot about, um, you, you, you need guys who can set good examples for your players. That's really important. You need guys for like an Eklund to play with too. Right. And so that's going to be something that the, he's going to suffer from, mm -hmm. uh, um, over the, the, the last 20 games here, but 
there's a balance there though too. Like if someone's waving two first rounders for you for for a hurdle, if someone's waving, you know, Duclair was a pending UFA. He, there's 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 no guarantee that that he would have come back, right? And of course, like for a guy like that, uh, whose game is like I said, it's good, but that but it's limited. Um, you don't want to overspend on a guy like that in terms of years, in terms yeah. of, of money too. And so if someone's willing to give you a, a decent pick in a third rounder, one this year and a pretty good prospect third in the prospect for Duclair, if you, if you had suggested that before he went on his hot streak, I think every, I think every fan would have, would have, would have been quite pleased with that. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, 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 <laughs> no problem. No. I have no problem with this. I think like, I'm going to, I'm going to say this flat out. Like I think Mike had an excellent uh, trade deadline here. I know that a lot of fans, because how much they love hurdle, I get that are, are going to hate my career forever. Um, but if I think the plan is good, if the execution works out, you're going to love my career in, in five years. That's a good way to say that. <laughs> um, yeah. I, uh, Almost everybody said he's going to get a third. We got a third and an actual NHL prospect, right. not like a third plus a 24-year-old who's like maybe an AHLer. The most optimistic projections, right? We talked to a team 33. I talked to this gal too, said yeah. second rounder maybe. And I'm not sure if, uh, you know, Thompson probably was like a fourth round pick prospect. So a third and a fourth, is that equivalent of second rounder? I don't know, right? So, sure. but yeah, it, it's it definitely deal. it's a good deal. You get that third that you kind of expected, plus a legit prospect that. Yeah, and I think the if the Sharks want him back, they can sign him in the offseason if he right. wants to come back to the San Jose Sharks. Um, yeah, I have no problem with the yeah. What is what is a uh, A plus? No notes. <laughs> no notes. A A A. I'd say A. No notes. A plus would be if you got like second plus Thompson. <laughs> A plus, <laughs> a no notes. Thomas uh, Hurdle, some notes. Some need some cliff notes. Need some explanation. Yeah. Okay, but a couple things uh, that are, yeah. are kind of sketchy, but not yeah. terrible. Yeah, uh, right. But but Claire, it's like, Duke, yeah, we. Yeah. This is what we wanted. We wanted no, no, no. to up his value. It's a, it's a pump his value, and then then trade him. For, I think the Sharks made prospects. one more deal that's even better than Duclair trade in some ways, but we'll get to that. <laughs> Ooh, okay. And I have no notes it, on. But... I have no notes on Duclair. Uh, yeah. Our other UFA, who I honestly was like, I can't believe we haven't traded him yet, based on the previous night where Magnus Krona was shelled for mm -hmm. seven goals. And I thought after the fifth goal that maybe he should be pulled because he was having a really rough night. And you can kind of yeah. you can kind of tell when a goaltender is not feeling it, and, and Magnus Krona was not feeling it. Mm -hmm. Um I really thought he was gonna get pulled and they didn't. I was like, this is weird. There's something strange happening here in Mike Greer or, or David Quinn's head about pulling him. Because in a, no, a normal night in November, Magnus Krona gets pulled. Why is Krona not, or why is Krona not getting pulled right, right now? So I was very worried after 3 p.m. struck that there was going to be no Kapanen or, or Kapo Kakanen deal. And I was surprised that one happened um, afterwards. I, um, I think a lot of fans are actually upset about this trade. And I like it, which is weird. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I guess, I guess we, we've turned. Uh, uh, guys, I just want to announce a new sponsorship. Uh, the San Jose Sharks are sponsoring us. Uh, we are now the. We are the Mike Greer podcast. <laughs> yeah. We are the we are the the MGAs, the, the Mike Greer apologists. Uh, we are. No, no, we're, we're not. I really though. like it. <laughs> I, I, I can't. I can't say I really like it, but I, I understand like it, it though. though. I don't think it's terrible though. And let me yeah. explain. Now let's first talk about why people think it is bad, right? Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, first, uh, Vanacek has had a terrible season. He's been one of the flat-out worst goalies in the league. Uh, number two, Vic is hurt, and he's probably done for the season. And so yes. you traded a healthy goalie who's had a pretty good season until the last couple of weeks for a guy a that goalie. a hurt goalie uh, who's been awful this year. Okay, so I get all that, right? Okay, so here's my rebuttal, and then I'm sure you have your thoughts on it too. Um, Vanacek uh, from 2020. 20 wait 23 22 20, 2021 mm -hmm. 20, from 2020 to 20 wait yeah sorry from 2020 to 2023 sorry uh, reciting my own stories here uh from 2020 to 2023 
in terms of uh, goal saved above expected, he was smack dab in the, in the middle for guys that played, you know, kind of a certain number of minutes, a lot of minutes, right? Uh, sure. He was like 20th of 40. Uh, a 40 goalies he had like a plus one nine set not not significant right it's no no Sorokin right but pretty average right for a starter right uh Kakin in the same period of time was 41st out of 43 goalies going into this season Kakin was the last three years Kakin had had been on the aggregate one of the worst starters in in the league um actually right ahead of Kakin there was a Blackwood a Blackwood of course had a lot of injuries so that's so he has sort of that excuse there um obviously this season it's kind of flipped for Vanacek Vanacek uh his uh his goals his goal his GSAX this year is uh, I think second to 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 worst second worst in the league I think maybe only Merz Leakins has been worse in that department uh Kakinen, before the last two weeks where he's been actually legitimately bad uh mm -hmm. he was average after the, the last two weeks, he's now gone into like he's now like a uh, bottom 25 percentile goalie in terms of uh, goal save above expected. Right. He might maybe he'll bounce back from that. Maybe he won't. But anyway, the point, though, is that the Sharks uh, basically traded uh, 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 they traded for a guy that's been historically better than Kakanen, who is about the same age. Uh, yeah. Vanacek is 28, Kaknin's 27, and Vanacek is fully expected to be healthy next year. And then the most important bit, too, uh, Vanacek is signed for next year. Vanacek mm -hmm. is signed for a 3.4 million, one more year, 3.4 million, right? And, of course, Kaknin was about to be a UFA. And so there's a couple things with Kaknin being UFA. First, did the Sharks really want to keep him, right? And it kind of seemed like they, didn't, they weren't that into it because they didn't. I don't think they made an offer to him this season, even when he was playing well, right? They didn't really, they didn't really sound like there was much sort of uh, movement there, right? And then also too, um, if if you wait till, if you just say like, okay, hey, you know what, we're stuck with Kaka, let's just resign him. Um, okay, that's that's fine. Uh, Key and Block would get along. Kaka has been good this year, right? But. Do you want to give him a multi-year? Is he going to accept that? He's a UFA too, so it's not like he's an RFA. It's not like he's under your control, right? So, so you could be stuck with no no goalie next to Blackwood if if Kaklin gets a better deal. If you're like, if you go to Cop and you're like, hey, you know, we're not really sure about you and Blackwood. Do you mind, you know, kind of doing another one year thing with us and you and Blackwood together, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe he says yes. Maybe you find the right dollar figure, right? Which probably wouldn't have been much higher than Vanacek's 3.4. Probably been a little under, right? But maybe another team goes to Kakin and says, hey, we'll give you two years. I mean, I think that's 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 feasible, right? That's not that's not out True. of the realm of possibility, right? And so at that point, then, do you want to match that? Do you want Kakin for two more years? I don't know. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, but in Vanacek, you have a guy that, again, you have cost certainty for next year at about the same rate that you would have paid Kakanen next year, but it's only for one more year. So you can, again, kind of figure out who is going to be your immediate Sharks goalie of the future, Blackwood, or now it's Vanacek, right? And if Vanacek is really good next year, which, again, in recent history, has shown the, the history of doing that, then you maybe you can you can – the pick that you thought you were going to get for Kaplan this year, that third rounder that didn't materialize, uh, maybe you'll get it for 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 Vanacek. And Mike Greer did say this very clearly that uh, sort of the goalie market evaporated. I yep. think basically after the Jake Allen trade, that there there weren't there might have been teams that wanted a goalie like Colorado, right? But you know, in terms of cap, there's reasons why it couldn't work, right? And obviously the Sharks lost their retention slot. Uh, with with the hurdle trade right and yep. so that could have been that could have been a deal that would that that was affected by by that uh, but anyway um so and i actually asked mike this directly and he was honest about it right usually you don't phrase things like things like this uh, this way to a gm and you don't get an honest answer but i said so basically you're kind of kind of punting the decision uh, on your goal thing until next year that's that's literally what i asked mike mike said yeah that's yep. basically basically what i'm doing so um I don't, I'm not as like high on a deal as you are. I don't think it was an outstanding deal, but I think it, it's a sensible deal. And sure. so it, it's fine. Uh, if you don't think Kaplan is the guy, um, and Capo's got a, a lot of talent, but track record right before this year doesn't, doesn't, doesn't add up well. And he doesn't have an injury sort of excuse like, like, uh, like Blackwood has, right? If you don't sure. think Kaplan is, is your guy for the next year or two, then this, this makes sense. Yeah, here's why I'm high on the deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think NHL GMs have to kind of put themselves in a position of like, 
um, yes or no's or like do or do nots, right? Mm -hmm. So if Vanacek becomes a very good starting goaltender for the Sharks, is he worth more than Cabo Kakinen? I'd say yes. Yes, you're right. Yeah, based on, again, the, the track record, right? The track, track record, record, right? right? Yeah. Like, people have traded, uh, Washington traded a second to get Kapanen mm -hmm. or uh, Vanacek Van back from the, the expansion draft from Seattle. Um, he was a good goaltender for a good team in New Jersey. If he's a good goaltender He's played playoff year, games, right? Exactly. He's been in the playoffs. He's around the same age as Kakanen. So I think he's worth more. He's worth, like, probably a second. Who knows? It At depends best, on how good yeah. he is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I wanted to add too that if, uh, he, if he, if he doesn't do well, he's also just a very bad goaltender for a team that's supposed to be horrible <laughs> next year. So who cares? Like, I mean, you need a goaltender and you need, it's all just, like you said, it's punting the decision and taking risks, but like calculated risks, like Kakanen probably could have got us a third or fourth or whatever. You're trying to get better than that or trying to be, you know, have goaltending, but if it's sure. terrible, we're terrible. It's what we're expected to be next year. And of course, you never know, right? Kaklin's still young. He's talented, right? He could go full sure. Aiden Hill on a Sharks ride. That would be Maybe. hilarious, right? But um, Another but, time. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, if you remember when we were talking about Kaklin uh, up to this point, right? The whole the whole bit about Kaklin was, yeah, he's having a good season for a bad team. That's great, but... He's never done this, like been a one a starter for a playoff team. We have no idea yep. how how he can handle that. You know, he wasn't seen as as a starter, right? And whereas <laughs> Vanacek hasn't been incredible, but last year in New Jersey, Vanacek plays fifty two games. Uh, even a year before in Washington, Vanacek plays forty two games, half the schedule, right? I don't think Kaplan has reached either of those. And also, Vanacek has played playoff games, wasn't great in them, but hey, he's played them at least, right? And so. Kakinen, I don't know if Kakinen's even surpassed uh, half half a season yet uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, in terms of a uh, uh, number of games that he's played, and so it's sort of trading a guy that also too right to your point of, of kind of ceiling right a guy Vanacek his ceiling right now is a one A. Ka uh, Kakinen is not far, but Kakinen is more of like a one B right until until Kakinen shows us something different, more of a one B, and so. In a lot of ways, in that sense, yeah, I I definitely get what you're saying. I mean, there are the other risks, obviously, in terms of just Vanacek's injury, right? You know, they tell us he's going to be healthy. Obviously, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I I I definitely I definitely uh, get what you're saying. And, and uh, yes, uh, uh, Kakinen's high uh, for a season is 37 last year. So yeah, so I. I... And who knows, like, and also the other, the third option of that is that Vanacek becomes like so good that you don't trade him, but you re-sign him. Yeah. And if, even if you're asking now, what, uh, if that, who's more likely for that to happen? It's all calculated risk, right? Um, just like the Aiden Hill trade. But yeah. if you're to ask me right now, who is most likely to be the kind of the Sharks kind of clear cut number one between Blackwood, Vanacek and Kakinen? Um, I gotta decide. I gotta think about Blackwood versus Vanacek, but mm -hmm. those two would be ahead of Kakinen in terms of just the likelihood. You know, Kakinen might be like a twenty percent chance at it, right? Whereas uh, Blackwood and Vanacek might be forty percent each, right? But yeah, uh, I, I I would definitely uh, uh, more likely think that one of those two guys, based on their past track record and talent, and sort of just what people say about them, right? Scouts that. It would be either of those two ahead of uh, Kakinen. So, was your favorite deal not the Kakinen for Vanity? Oh, no, it's uh, it's the Shimmick deal. Tell me about the Shimmick deal. Why do you love the Shimmick deal so much? I I, I thought it was good. Uh, it's kind of out of nowhere. I honestly, we 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 both thought like, oh, Radim Shimmick's not going to get traded to the deadline. Well, yeah, who who would have who would have thought that, right? But look, um, there the, is. Way, <laughs> the way the way I see it is not obviously not in terms of uh, the 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 quality of the asset. The best thing the Sharks got in a trade deadline is either Edstrom or the twenty twenty five pick, right? There's no question about that part of it, right? Mm -hmm. But it's about the pure upside of this trade. Um, you have a guy like 
<clears throat> like Shimmick, that's not in the NHL, right? He's been with the Barracuda all season. He's also 31. He's going to be a UFA. He has no future in your organization unless, I don't know, he's the captain of your team, sure. uh, captain of your Barracuda team, I mean, right? If he continues at that, right? And even as good a job as he's done at, at that, right? Again, his age, all those kind of things, right? He's a guy that, again, has no future with your team. He's going the wrong way in his career for sure, right? Yep. And you traded him for a guy in Clint Costin. And the cost really is, uh, you know, pun intended, the cost really is taking that $2 million cap hit. Uh, he, has, he had a two-year deal, right, with the Red Wings. He has one more year after this year. One more. So you're taking that, that cap hit from – you're basically saving the Red Wings $2 million. And then meanwhile, though, you're taking a chance on a guy who's 24 mm -hmm. – um, he is one of those bullshit first round picks. Whereas, like, if you're if you if you if you put him in a deal right now, you're like, oh yeah, he's a first rounder. No, he was a first rounder in 2017. Obviously, his star has fallen quite a bit from that. But as recently as a couple of years ago with the Oilers, uh, 2022, 23, he had a very good season with them. It's sort of a secondary kind of sure. a role, right? And so he's still young, and he's a guy. I talk with people, right? Uh, the the favorite thing I've heard of about him that consistent theme is he's good if he wants to be. <laughs> He <laughs> could if he wants to be. I like it. And right. that doesn't sound great in terms of like, okay, I don't know if this guy is going to really uh, be a future part of the Sharks, right? But what everyone agrees on is that the overall talent is there with him for him to be a viable NHL player. It's about sort of unlocking the motivation and getting mm -hmm. that consistent, all that kind of stuff, right? Which is hard, obviously. It's not a, I'm not saying that's routine or easy, right? But the upside of that, right? Even though the upside is probably limited, obviously, it's not like he's going to turn around and be Timo Meyer or something like that, right? Sure. Like if he's Fabian Zetterlin, I think you're thrilled, right? But the upside of that isn't really high. But again, for the cost though, um, for for Shimmick, and yeah, he sent the he sent the seventh seventh round pick to them too. For I, I mean, this in terms of like what you gave up uh, and the upside and the upside you get back, this is the mm -hmm. best Sharks deal for sure. Uh, Hurdle, obviously, you lost an incredible player on the ice who's going to help your young players like Eklund, etc. Also, uh, incredible, uh, uh, incredible ambassador for your team on and off the ice, right? And hurdle. So you, you lost some, uh, really a lot there. There's no question about it. Got a lot back, but you lost a lot, right? Uh, Duclair, not the impact of a hurdle, but Duclair still a good angel player, as we can see, uh, was a good uh was was a was popular among his teammates mm -hmm. right took the time uh to 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 mentor guys like a bordolo Eklund, and zetterlin right so all important things right uh, uh for uh, uh for this group and Shimmick don't want to take it away from him. I've heard nothing but great stories about how he's impacted players at the Barracuda level right but this is just all upside, though. There's, there's, there's just like if Costin's no good, it just, it just two million of Hostel's money gone, and if Hostel becomes half of the player, or I mean, if if Hossel, I'm sorry, if if Costin can't go back to what he was doing for the Oilers, then suddenly you've got a viable player. Um, that then you can decide what to do with him the, the year after. Maybe you flip him for a draft pick. Maybe you re-sign him and he's part of your, your future, kind of like a Zadina, right, uh, yeah. where he's young enough to be part of it. Also, the, he's a guy that speaks to what you said last time at uh, the last podcast about the kind of players that the Sharks uh, uh, should target. these guys, right? And this, is, and this, is, this is exactly what they should be doing because uh, they have a lot of cap space. They have a lot of roster space. They have a lot mm -hmm. of lines and jobs up for grabs, right? So you can use this to kind of try to figure out guys that um, that could be a part of your future. Of course, you got to keep the culture good and, uh, you know, all the, the room has to be good. Yeah, they had to be good influences on uh, Eklund and all those kind of guys, right? So that's that's another part of it. We can't forget that. But, um, but yeah, like a guy guy like a like a costin um a fallen star but again as recently as two years ago with the oilers was doing some really good things for a playoff team too uh, for yeah. a really good team there um that if you can get him back to that then uh yeah this this is again the perfect kind of uh this is as by low as possible this basically as by low as possible as the sharks could have traded to and to get somebody of a reasonable upside um yeah. What you hope from the Sharks is that they're not going to spend like two million dollars on a thirty-eight-year-old, right? Well, and they, they haven't done anything like that, right? I know that's what I'm saying. Like they, yeah. he's he's buying low on guys that maybe in the future, it's all it's all chances, right? You just you have these limited amount of a assets essentially for an NHL franchise, and you you try and take the amount of chances that you can to improve the odds that those are better players in the future, and you're it's. 
I think it's fine. Like Radim Shimmick and a seventh are not going it's anywhere. A, it's a, it's a, yeah, I, I did a, you guys, you guys might, might, might have seen this by the time you listen to this. I did a, a grades for NBC on, on the trade. Mm-hmm. I'm probably repeating a lot of what I wrote in the article here, but I gave two, two trades an A. What do you think? Yeah. What are two trades I gave an A? <laughs> Well, I guess this one, and um, man, that's tough to say. I, I, I honestly would go with like Carolina, but no, 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 the, of the shark steals. The oh, shark the shark steals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was the only ones uh, I graded. I don't care about the yeah, <laughs> other teams in the league. Hmm. Anthony Duclair, probably. Yep, yep, yeah. because that's again, that's almost all upside too. Because pending yeah. UFA, you, you know, you maybe you were gonna sign him, maybe you weren't. He can walk, right? Anyway, mm-hmm. if he really wants to come back, you can sign him anyway and still come out of it with an extra third round pick and an extra extra prospect in, in, in uh, Jack Thompson. And so just that's just all upside, right? Straight There's, upside for yeah. sure. And so I gave the hurdle a B. I gave uh because I had to give something a C, I gave the Kakanen a C plus because I, I mm-hmm. get it, but you know. Magic has to be healthy and be and, and be good. Yeah. A lot um, of ifs. A lot of sure. ifs, right? Um, and okay, so then the next the next deal. Uh, anyway, let's let's just kind of wrap up. Unless you have anything more to say about nope. uh, Redding Shimmick was, or Clint, I think Costin. it was fine. I think Costin is exactly the player that I agree likes the target and uh, young enough that maybe he'll make an impact. And yeah. and you never know. So I like it. And Shimmick wasn't. He was a UFA and seven. No future, yeah, so. with the, with the organization, really, yeah, except yeah. You're basically just uh, paying for the upside to get two million off of mm-hmm. Detroit's books. So I like it. Uh, next is uh, Hotiuk, who was traded to Calgary um, for a conditional fifth, which is basically like it's to- basically going to be Chicago's fifth round pick because I think Chicago uh, yeah. has two fifth round picks and it's the lowest or it's the highest or the best of, of the, the better Chicago's of, two yeah. 2024 fifth round picks. And we know, yeah, it's, it's going to be Chicago's picks. <laughs> mm-hmm. So exactly. uh, anyway, on, on this deal. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's a little bit of a surprise because obviously he came in a Timo Meyer trade and they did talk him up uh, quite a bit as sort of a sleeper guy in the trade. Right. Um, I had, I heard at the end there that Philadelphia was in on it too um so uh, that's neither here nor there for the discussion but anyway though i think with hotuk um what they liked about him he is he's physical he's fairly mobile for his size there's a lot of pluses in that regard right but man his puck play was rough his puck play was legitimately yep. bad, bad at at this level and he really should have been in the in the ahl but because of his waiver situation right they would have to he had to go through waivers mm-hmm. um, and the Sharks were probably worried that, that they would lose him. Right. And there was some interest in him. Like you can see here with Calgary and Philadelphia, uh, they're worried that they're going to lose him that for nothing uh, that they, they kept him up the, the, the whole year. Honestly, it, uh, I think at a little bit of a disservice to a whole he should be down in AHL applying his trade mm-hmm. and kind of working on getting those puck touches and being better at that. In addition to with a Hotiuk too, I do wonder if he's a guy that, um, sort of uh handles the I say, I, this is something i've heard uh, that basically like handles mistakes you know like kind of mm-hmm. kind of kind of brush off mistakes well sure and you need the attitude of handling with mis- uh, uh, you need the attitude of being able to brush off mistakes when you play for this sharks team if you don't have that <laughs> attitude <laughs> then you're gonna be you're gonna be shell-shocked for years and years <laughs> and people wonder why henry thrun keeps getting played right henry thrun has had a very rough last couple of weeks or yes, so he right has. but thrun's makeup though uh, from what i understand talking with people talking with henry myself right like you just you, you get a sense that um and maybe at some point he's gonna break of course right i mean i even saw i, I told you guys this like during the sharks 0 10 and 1 streak right in the beginning of the season i saw nico Sturm break and start making plays like what, what are you doing nico <laughs> mm-hmm. you know because i think he was at, at a certain point and that that's a guy that's like as much of like a machine and i mean that in the most like complimentary way of, of anybody in the sharks room sure. um but anyway um so so Henry might have a breaking point, but definitely his his tolerance and sort of his sort of his um, ability to brush off his mistakes and move on, right, is is I think a, a lot a lot higher than than mm-hmm. he does, and so I think that's kind of a factor in in, in all this too. Not not a Henry Thrun versus a Hotu comparison, but just that uh, that's something that that is a reason why. Um, 
uh, maybe they weren't as optimistic that that, sure. that Ahotia could turn it around and why they let him go um, kind of while he still has some value for, uh, you know, just a okay pick. Yeah, I never, um, not never believed in Nikita Ahotia. I just, um, I never got a handle on him, I think is a good way to put it. He was traded and I never had a good viewing of him before he was in the NHL. And then NHL viewings, of him I, I found kind of mixed like mm -hmm. good on uh good physicality at some points decent defensively and then with really awful puck decisions and really yep uh, yeah so I, I just um i never saw like more than what he was which is a depth defenseman um and to get you know they got a fifth round pick for it i think it's fine if you're they're kind of got overloaded a little bit in the defensive end even if no, uh, Ahotik is young, he's going to be put on waivers at the beginning of next trade. Probably, yeah. Beginning of next um, uh, training camp. So, yeah. I mean, maybe put on waivers by even, you know, Calgary who traded for him. So, right. We'll next, by next by, by next year, yeah, he, he might have. Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah, like, I think a guy like Thompson is, is ahead of him in the system in terms yep. of just how he's regarded and stuff like that. McLeodolan's ahead of him. Thrones oh, McLeodolan's far ahead of him, right? There's not yeah. even a question about that. Exactly. Um, and so and who, who we're, talking about, we're talking about guys immediately, too. We're not talking about guys that are, like, far away, like a Cagnoni or whatever. We're talking yeah. about guys directly, like, in, that are gonna like in front of jump them. That are going to jump them and put them on waivers. Them, right? yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, that's... no, it's... That's uh, it's Greer thinking ahead, basically, is I think to so, the yeah. to the off season, and I'm fine with it. I think it was a good trade. Yeah, I think they liked the idea of a guy like that. Like they they called him a throwback. That was the classic thing that hmm. they said about him when they traded for him. True. Um, and they got a close look at him. They're like, hey, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. So our um last deal is Devin <laughs> Cooley for a twenty was it twenty twenty five seventh? Is it was? Yeah. I think it was the same seventh that they got from the Vanishek and Kakinen deal, right? Yeah. Well, this is uh, this is the this is the veteran goalie that the Barracuda probably needed. One hundred percent at the beginning of the season. He's not quite as good as Aaron Dell or that. He you know, doesn't have any NHL experience, right? But he's he's a guy that's going to stabilize things. Also, too, with Blackwood out for however long Blackwood is out, um, that he's going to help. Uh, just have somebody viable behind uh, Prona, um, or mm -hmm. maybe Cooley will get some starts. And so, yeah, it's a pretty uh, kind of a, a blah trade, of course, right? Uh, I 100 trade that you kind of need to make, right? So, I have 100 percent like head cannon that I watched Greer last night watching Crona get shelled, mm -hmm. and then he went, ah, shit, I'm going to take you back in the next tomorrow and, and Blackwood, Blackwood's not coming back and, and, least, and so, I need yeah. to get another goalie and that's why he was like all right yeah. going to seven so I can get Cooley like I 100% I saw his face and he was just <laughs> Magnus Corona listen like the seventh goal and and Kat, or Greer was like all right fine I'm gonna get Devin Cooley that's hey like who knows what I um, Makanyemi I think he backed up tonight is is, is that is that what, what I read I mean I haven't been able to pay any attention to the Barracuda yes he did he did he backed right? up tonight and right. he was healthy enough to back up and right and I think I think I believe he had he had he had mono I think I mentioned that last mm -hmm. podcast so it's good that he's back from that right yep and so it could be you know uh Makanyemi is a guy that that people do like his talent just can't stay healthy maybe he can stay healthy yeah. for these last 20 games maybe he comes up and he backs up Krona or Blackwood and so so, uh, yeah, by the way, though, you just need a more depth in the system, right? Because you weren't going to call Romanov and, and, and Krona. Uh, I know, I know, I know we're trying to tank, but, uh, you know, let's not be so obvious guys. <laughs> he was like, I can't do this to Krona. I need to get somebody that's going to play goalie. Um, after I trade Kak and then I, I 100% think that's what happened. <laughs> Maybe he always had this idea. But I think it was a, a well, smart move. I do think that again. I go back to this. I've said this before. That the idea they should have had the beginning of the season and not mm -hmm. thrown three young goalies to, to the wolves of the Barracuda. Um, but anyway, yeah. that's neither here nor there, though. So yeah, it was not a um, successful run of goaltending for for them. And and honestly, the Sharks are maybe, maybe we'll talk about this in another episode. But yeah, we're still missing like a goaltending pipeline of sorts. Oh, sure, sure. They have nobody in the system. I mean... That's young I mean, and, like, promising. Like, really young, right? Way. Because they... they we all expected them to draft a goalie last year, and yep. I know they like some guys. I think they like Guyane, but... Uh, mm -hmm. 
they you know those guys all 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 went before maybe the sharks thought that yeah. that that they should go and so they didn't get any of those guys and so yeah yeah i mean they don't really uh, have a goalie of the future at all no no yeah because yeah bull pit is is in the i bull pit's playing like the bchl i think right mm-hmm. you know Gaudreau, they obviously let Gaudreau walk um and Gaudreau hasn't had like exceptional season in his old rage season right so yeah um so yeah it's uh it's uh anyway it's <laughs> <laughs> i'll have to find out answer for that solution at some point but i guess that's yeah the point has come up later but yeah i think this trade was fine um seventh yeah. pick that they got from the other trade don't really care and interesting story at least for devin cooley yeah so, los gatos native yeah yeah so i like it i i'm gonna give the overall san jose sharks trade deadline a uh b b I'm gonna, solid b i'm gonna give it an a, a even though the hurdle i rated more as a b because um I mean, you always, anytime a trade that big, you do think about what could it like, uh, maybe it could get a little bit more because Thomas Hurdle is so good, right? And all that stuff. Yeah. Right? But along with the kind of the the deals I really liked with Shimmick and Duclair and mm-hmm. the Banachek Kakinen, I understood at least, right? True. Um, maybe A minus, but I, I don't, I usually don't rate things that Sharks do that, that, that highly, but I, I, I really, I mean, like I mentioned, like I, I feel like I, I, I have a reasonable understanding of the direction that they've been in for a while, mm-hmm. but I really like the sort of the commitment to it today and what they got in return too. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I thought, and I, I, this might go contrary because I have hardly looked at Twitter, but I, the few things I've seen, um, people, uh, people are very, very upset. <laughs> and I understand very again, because it's Tom Osherdo, but I'm on it. Just, I'm not a fan. So on a pure hockey side though, I, I think that Mike had a very, very good trade deadline. It doesn't even matter how the picks turn out because that's all going to be hindsight. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, but it's more about sort of just like at this time right now, were these the right moves to make for each and every one of these players? I would say so. Yeah um the only one that's even debatable i mean yeah i mean there's some debate on hurdle some debate on captain but uh actually i don't think there's much about hurdle you get two first round picks for a guy that yeah so i don't think there's in my mind there's no debate on hurdle so captain's only one where okay yeah maybe you should have resigned him he's a good guy he gets along well with blackwood all that kind of stuff right but uh anyway besides that though like Every move was the player that they should have you know it's a player they should have traded and mm-hmm. they got back a reasonable return except for Kakinen, which I excuse him for because Kakinen was not the top of the market goalie, right? He was no Markstrom who didn't get traded, but he was not uh, yeah. Allen either, who was sort of the top of the market in terms of the one A, one B types, right? So it was a weird goalie market. They mentioned that multiple mm-hmm. times. So yeah. I'm not gonna blame it on uh on Mike Group. I'm I'm becoming quickly a micro apologist and <laughs> the MGAs, the MGAs. And <laughs> I didn't start off negative on my career, but I think I just. I think everybody clamored for a rebuild for so long. Yeah. And, and this is it. This, this is, is a rebuild. rebuild. This is it. It yeah. sucks. We're going to be bad. The next pick, the, the, the next step is drafting the right guys, which we have no idea. Right. But yeah. like. The this right a, moves to crew more picks, they've been made. Yep. And to be worse. And yep. we're going to be very, very bad. And the prospects acquired, at least at the moment, they appear like they've been good uh, acquisitions, right? So yeah. look, I really, I, I honestly Smith, think that, that stuff, right? So yeah. Mike Greer wants to finish last in the standings this year because we have traded away our goaltending depth, <laughs> our scoring depth, our best center. We have nothing in terms of well like, I, I think I think he wanted it last year too, but uh, Eric, Eric Carlson to get in a fucking way and score hundred points. Yeah. So <laughs> and now he's like, I need the BU kid. Like if I yeah. don't get the BU kid, I don't know what to yeah. do. Yeah, so. but this year though, obviously Couture is out, Hurdle yep. gets hurt, Granlin's hurt to begin the season. I mean, just like, yeah, what's the point at a certain point, right? So yeah, yeah it's a cacophony of like yeah, terribleness. Yeah. So I think I'm using I don't know actually know what the word cacophony means. And I also used the word diatribe wrong earlier. 
Um, the cacophony is, I think, a bunch of like uh, a kind mix, of discordant, right? yeah, like 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 a uh, noise mm. that is, uh, but noise that doesn't blend well together. It's like discordant noise. So it's like a cacophony of errors, I guess. For the show. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Which all... which I would say you can argue you can say was the mm -hmm. end of the Wilson era. <laughs> yeah, and, and I didn't want to say a diatribe on the Thomas Hurdle thing. I wanted to say like a, a diatribe is angrier. Yeah, angrier. <laughs> exactly. I'm not angry. I think it's fine. Um. <laughs> I, uh, anyway, I'm happy, even though I'm a little sad. That's the best way to put this. I'm happy, but sad. And Shang, you got to go home and sleep. No, I got to keep, keep writing. So keep writing. <laughs> I got to be writing till like day. three in the morning. You guys, um, yeah, hopefully not because yeah, the games are early games. So it won't be till three in the morning, but, uh, uh but anyway, though, uh, yeah, but it's, it's been a really long day though, for sure. Yeah. So I, I am near the end of, of, uh, <laughs> yeah, for of sure. this all. We got to also put, put this, put, put, put this, uh, put this puppy, uh, to bed to get this out there too. So <laughs> yeah, well, I got to go we'll edit this podcast, yep. release it. And then anyway, I hope everybody's doing okay with this news. It's, it's rough. And, um, I don't think there's going to be another one that's going to hurt as bad as this. Like, Couture's slow lingering injury hurts a lot, but I don't know if there's going to be another one that hurts. No, like there, there won't be. This this was this was the worst one of them. This uh, is it. All. I mean, even the Burns one doesn't doesn't, doesn't feel like this because because Burns was not in his prime anymore, yeah. and you know Hurdle still was close enough to it. I mean, yeah, Meyer. I I think never as good as Meyer was. He never kind of achieved like the stardom, right? That yeah. uh, that that yeah. at least at least among the fan base, right? That 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 hurdle did i mean the only one that's worse is pavelski walking i guess right and so that's that's the one that and we didn't even uh, know that was bad until afterwards didn't yeah. know for sure yeah some people some people i mean some people thought so i guess yeah for sure, sure. i don't want to take great, great credit that of uh, the people that were talked about emphasized pavelski's leadership and all that kind of stuff but yeah mm -hmm. so that's the only one close but the yeah burns meyer uh carlson right um yeah not 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 even close so this yeah this one is the one that's going to hurt hurt the most uh even it counts too you know doug wilson departing right mm -hmm. uh there's so many been so many departures right joe thornton leaving for toronto i think that one hurt the fan base a lot too. that one hurt a lot uh but joe obviously was not quite uh was not even close to his prime and i think everyone wanted joe to win too so they were pretty okay like they Whatever were that, it was more support want, for him uh, leaving, right? So, yeah. What I want people to take away from this is is not that like you shouldn't feel bad that it that it hurts. It's that 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 period of sharks for like twenty years was special, and like you should feel honestly good that you were a part of something that was special, even if they didn't win the Stanley Cup. There was something about that Sharks team that was cohesive, and it, sure. it made people want to play for the Sharks, and it made them want to be better. To the point where, like, yeah, continuity, are, continuity, and players right. are coming back after their careers, like mm -hmm. Smith and Hannon and Demers oh, and, Jumbo and Ricci, and Jumbo and Marlo, and, and it, it, like players want to come back because they want to feel that feeling that you felt as a fan twenty years ago. And like, don't don't think that because this is over that that never happened. It did, and it was something that you know we got to experience as Sharks fans and. Whether or not we, we didn't win a Stanley Cup, but it was it was special. So don't forget that it it was special and be sad that it's over. But there is a new era of sharks. And let's give credit where it's due to because he spent a lot of time uh, shitting on 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 his last few years. But that continuity, a lot of it was well, it was established by Lombardi at first, but goes yep. to Wilson, right? And yep. he trades for Jumbo. He he has Marlow, right? So Jumbo and Patty, right? Drafts yep. Pavelski. Drafts Vlasic, drafts Couture, drafts Hurdle, um, and so, so, so you have this kind of this 15, 20 years of, of just basically just these guys Great. just linking to each other, right? You have Marlowe to Jumbo to Pavelski to Couture to Hurdle, and then Burns is in there too, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was it was it was an incredible run. Um, there's the, oh, obviously only just one thing missing, but that is the very hard thing to win. So I would I don't yeah. fault Wilson for that part of it, and even the moves in the end there to re-sign Carlson, even moves that didn't even trading for Kane and re-signing him, right? Um, which. Uh, they were all moves to try to get that elusive title for Jumbo, for Patty, or for mm -hmm. or for Path, and 
So even just, beyond yeah. the even beyond like getting the right draft pick and the right players for the Sharks, that's the part that's hard for Mike Greer is to get that level of fandom back. To oh, get sure. that level, that's the hardest job, I think. That's and the it's, one. It's gonna be hard. hard. Yeah, it's, you're seeing like record low numbers of Sharks fans. You're gonna keep tank. seeing those because you know absolutely nobody out there, right? So I, so, I, I, I get all that. But that's um, the hardest part to me yeah. is getting that culture back and and getting those fans back that experienced that kind of team for 20 years. That's the real challenge, I think. But and people don't don't appreciate that in terms of what they what Mike Greer needs to do for this. Rebuild. But, you know, and this was Wilson's uh, mistake in the end. You weren't going to get it back with the guys nope. that <laughs> that that you established uh, established it with first. And I understand why you thought you could get it back with them for uh, for a year or two there. Right. But you weren't going to. Yeah, uh, they 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 were just a little a touch too old to be dominant and you weren't able to supplement underneath with, 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 with support players. Like you were able to do for so long. Right. Uh, with Don Skoy types and guys like that. Right. Yeah. And so, so yeah, yeah so it was going to end. You, it just, uh, yeah. It just was going to end. So you don't know what you got till it's gone and, yep. and it was gone. So, yeah. But again, and don't feel sad that it, or don't feel like it wasn't real. Cause media, the national media will shit on the sharks for the next, I don't know, five years. But it was real, and don't forget it. So that's it. That's my uh, my sign off for the Sharks because I was there. You all <laughs> you all remember that it was a great time, even if it's bad now. So, all right. Anything else? Let's wrap up this trade deadline. This was way more emotional than I thought it would be, but very emotional. Yeah. No. I. Uh, yeah. I, I. I'm ready to keep to keep writing and yeah, mm -hmm. do something too. And <laughs> yeah. So. For sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna Nico Sturm it the rest of the night. I'm just gonna machine this the rest of the night. So it's a good idea. I'm gonna go to bed. Uh, I hope you guys all have a good week and a great rest of the NHL season. We will see you next week with whatever sharks news we could dig up, I guess. If you guys week. see me around, you guys want to talk some Tomas Shirtle. Um if uh if sort of my optimism about it does uh it's still not clear to you. I, I, Talk, you know, talk to me. I'll be, I'll be happy to sort of uh, uh, talk with you uh, about it. Um, I know, again, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough, 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 tough day. You know, again, I, arguably sure. the worst day in Sharks history. <laughs> um, I don't know. If that's exaggeration, though. I don't know. Um, actually, well, can we end with that? Can you think of off the top of your head? Uh, Sharks losing this Stanley like, Cup to Pittsburgh was the worst day in Sharks history, I think. Okay, so. but you were still in the final, though. So yeah, I know. But that was the You're one. Still, I think. I let me put it this way. I think any fan would take losing a fine, uh, the deciding game of the final to this day. So I would say today is still the worst day. You just lost. Yeah. You yeah, basically, arguably yeah. lost two franchise star players, franchise icon players. Uh, maybe not franchise players, but icon players today. Arguably, you don't. We obviously don't know what's going to happen with with Logan. Um, I'm gonna think so, on it let's, before let's, I answer, <laughs> but I'll answer next let's, week. Uh, it's a possibility, right? Yeah, for sure. sure. <laughs> All right. Hope you guys have a okay week. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.